We've, uh, we've asked Professor John Mack on a couple of occasions to come and address the Congress, and at long last, um, he's made it here. Yeah. So Professor Mack is, is kind of an icon, I would say, in the field of abduction research. And the reason that he is is because he's probably the most heavily credentialed, most public guy that has come forward with his work in this phenomena. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that his findings and his research is any more valid than anybody else's? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean is that even though it's not fair, it's not accurate, it's not right, his findings may mean more than anyone else's when they're released. And because of the fact that when John Mack talks, people listen, they can't ignore it, he puts so much on the line because of this. A doctor, a department head, he, they tried to crucify him. They did. They tried to put him on the street. Thank God it didn't happen for all of us, and especially for John. But this is what he risked, and I want all of you to be aware of it. And you know, guys, just because the big flack about trying to get him removed is over, the truth is every time he comes to talk to anyone publicly about these subjects, he puts it on the line. He's risking it all for the truth. John Mack. Thank you. Ooh, right. Thank you, Bob. Um, I want to thank uh, Bob and Terry, and uh, also especially uh, Melanie and Jim Rogers of the technical crew. Uh, only they know what they've had to put up with with me uh, as a um, somebody uh, relatively in the Stone Age when it comes to certain kinds of technologies. Uh, so. Uh, I, I feel this conference uh, is much is about much more than UFOs. Um, it has been subjects that, that are not simply UFO related, uh, like the communications from uh, the other dimension on electronic media or uh, the discussions of, of energy. But beyond that, there's a meaning here that translates into the world, and that's very much what I want to address in, in this talk. I'm going to try to get done uh, so there's at least 15, 20 minutes for discussion uh, at the end. So that means I'm going to have to go through uh, some of this very quickly. But uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk with you about is uh, elementary to a group like this, but uh, I think hope, not, not all of it will be. Um, one of my um, most beloved teachers is uh, Eric Erickson, who I guess in our generation is kind of next to Freud and Jung up there at the, among the psychoanalysts. And the way he talked about his work uh, it was always very simple. And he said he, just was, he had just worked out a way of looking at things. So that's what I'm going to try to do, modeled on that, uh, is pre present a kind of overview, but a way of looking at things in this field. There'll be many more questions here than answers. Um, and I'm particularly interested in what the obstacles have been to our being more effective in moving our, what we have to say, which is so tremendously important, into uh, the larger world. So, um, well, I guess a word that uh, Rod used on Tuesday is empowerment. 
I, I want us to be more empowered somehow and contribute to that. That's, that's a very high uh, priority uh, for me. So then I'm going to also uh, talk a lot about the matter of the reptilians, and I think you'll see how that relates to uh, the overview. But I want to use that as an example uh, of a subject that invites the complex thinking, which I believe is essential in this, in this field. And then at the end, I'm going to try to pull this together to what was said in the program I was going to talk about, which is what this all has to do with the present crisis and the world and dualistic thinking and, and all that. Uh, before I overlook this, I want to thank uh, one of the people back home, uh, Will Boucher, who's our webmaster, for his help in uh, providing the graphics for the slides. I'm responsible for the content, but he's responsible for some of the, I think, quite beautiful and sometimes slightly wacky uh, graphics that you're uh, going to see. So let's move into this. Why is the subject of UFOs and alien encounters important? I put the word alien in quotes because I, I don't want to prejudice this subject by using words that have a certain kind of connotation for us. An alien is somebody who comes from a foreign land, usually somebody you don't want to cross your borders. Uh, and I, I want to avoid any language of, of that kind. Here are some of the reasons. If we're not alone in the universe, this is a matter of earth-shaking significance. I must have skipped one. That's all right. Uh, there is much to be learned of a scientific, technical, and military nature from the craft and their occupants. The implications for our understanding of human identity who we really are in the universe and of reality itself are immense. There are great social, political, and economic implications. Virtually none of our institutions would be unaffected. So what exactly is the alien encounter phenomenon? That may seem like a very elementary question, but you could get quite a good battle going over uh, on over that uh, simple we think we know but uh, I, I think it's worthwhile to go back to basics sometimes visitation of alien spacecraft from other planets star systems or universes or other dimensions well yeah probably the penetration of varying density and intensity into our perceptual fields of images, energies, and objects that are sometimes, but not always, extraterrestrial spacecraft. Encounters with beings and energies that interact with human beings in a variety of ways. Other Earth-originated military activity, hoaxes, illusions, delusions, holographic projections from some other place or source, etc. None of the above. I don't know what that means, but I just threw that in there. So what are some of the fundamental questions that we start with? Are UFOs real? Well, to this crowd, that's a no-brainer. Are aliens really abducting people? Well, yeah. Um, we certainly have a lot of evidence that uh, sometimes some people seem to be taken into spacecraft uh, by non- or hu humanoid beings. But is it always that? Aren't there sometimes contacts, at least that's true in my experience with this population, many instances where there's a presence, energies, light, 
communication where the person is not taken physically into a spacecraft, yet something very vital is happening between the human being and the other beings involved. Why is this happening? Why are they coming here? Now, the question, uh, Angela raised the question uh, earlier today, well, they're not here to save us, uh, or they're not doing it anyway. Um, and that's right, but it, there may be another way of thinking about it. Was what they, for example, they might be opening up our way of relating to each other, to the universe, of knowing ourselves, expanding by the cracking of the way we think to expand consciousness. In that way, that might be the most important thing that they might do. I'm not saying that's what they're here for, but if that happens, uh, it can't be a bad thing. Is this a relatively new phenomenon or an ancient one? That question gets asked a lot, and looking back to Ezekiel's wheel and uh, other examples where there appear to be something like abductions going on. That we heard about the jinns. Uh, yet there is something kind of hard-edged about the current uh, UFO or alien abduction phenomenon. It, it seems to penetrate real hard-edged into our reality, affecting uh, very many people. And maybe that has something to do with the current state of, of the world. Where do the craft and their occupants come from? Well, we don't know. We don't even know if they come from the physical world as we know it, from another dimension. Um, we kind of know they're here. Maybe they're in our, uh, maybe we're uh, sharing this, this space with them in some way. The, the Dalai Lama once said to a group of us, uh, those beings, they're very upset. That's why they're here because we're, we're disturbing their spiritual and physical environment. What are the beings' intentions? Do they help us? Are they friendly, unfriendly, indifferent, caring, benign, threatening, variable? Well, it depends. Sometimes one or another, but more important than that, I think, is the invitation they give us, and I'd like to share, that to look at the anthropocentrism of that way of thinking. In other words, it looks at it in terms of are they good to us or not. It doesn't look at what are we up to and who are we and could, this be a, could we be a problem, for instance, not only in the, on the Earth but in the galaxy. I get some information that we don't, we don't even get, a, the galaxy doesn't think very well of us. I mean, our reputation has extended quite <laughs> far. Um, if the phenomenon is real, what should we humans do about it? Well, we'll come to that. I'll get into that more. It's just going to throw that out as a question at this point. What is the best way to study the phenomenon? How do we know who or what to believe? So I'll, I'll address that as I go along uh, with this talk. But I want to get into now this uh, next, the question of the problem of getting this accepted or having people, uh, as the last speaker said, when they ask the question, uh, to at least look at the data, at least be willing to open their minds to, to what's there. What, what, what closes people's minds? Or what, what is, what's the problem with this subject? Now, you, we all have many thoughts about that, but I wanted to lay out some of my own uh, ideas. All right, I just pushed it. Okay, uh, there we are. Uh, why isn't the reality more generally accepted? What are the resistances? Blanket denial, variously motivated, it's widespread, just 
I don't believe it. Doesn't matter what you tell me. Uh, you know, it's not possible. And uh, let's not let's not even talk about it. Now, this this one's more interesting. If UFOs exist, UFOs exist. But the idea that strange beings are abducting people is beyond believing. Now, uh, you've heard about my Harvard uh, entanglement. Um, the uh, committee that investigated uh, me for 15 months in 94 and, and 95. And I, I don't talk about it a lot, but in, in this context, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's worth uh, thinking about a little bit, or telling you a little bit about what, what I mean, uh, why I'm bringing this in here. Um, at one point in the, uh, well, even at the very beginning, when the uh, senior associate dean for academic affairs handed me the letter t telling me that, that there had been some questions raised, probably by wealthy alumni, about uh, what I was doing and so forth, uh, he said, you know, John, if you, and we were pretty good friends, he said, you know, if you had just said you'd found a new psychiatric uh, condition that we don't know the cause of, you'd have been okay. Uh, it's because you said that it meant we might have to think about reality differently that you got into trouble. Now, he didn't realize that he, by saying that, he was coming from the assumption that our knowledge of reality is fixed and that if you do anything to shake that up, that's deviance or heresy or whatever the words we, we have for those things. Um, at one time, in the, in the course of the case, the lawyer for the president of Harvard said to my lawyer, well, what do you think it's like for the dean of the Harvard Medical School to watch on Oprah Winfrey, uh, one of his professors, saying that little green men are taking men, women, and children into space? Now, I never, uh, I don't think the dean of the Harvard Medical School ever watched Oprah Winfrey, uh, but uh, <laughs> nor have I, of course, ever referred to any of these beings as little green men. But in that statement, you can sense the anxiety that this must have stirred up uh, at the higher levels uh, of the university. Something just got removed from my chair. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's fine. I, I trust your motives here. Um, now, um, some people may accept a lot of things, but this somehow this phenomenon crosses, crosses be the, a, a boundary for them. It just goes beyond what they can believe. I've seen that with this. I've seen that also with the, with the crop circles. Uh, I have a friend who's a psychology professor who's very open-minded, and she's a person who's done research on hypnosis and non-ordinary states of consciousness, a real explorer. And she totally didn't believe in this whole crop circle thing. And uh, she'd heard a little bit about it. So I showed her some of the pictures. And she looked at that. And she said, I've got no place to put that. <laughs> now, she was being honest. Because what, what she was doing was she was acknowledging the way a world view prevents anything new from coming in. But most people don't even acknowledge that their worldview is determining what they think, what they feel. They think they're talking about something based on an argument. I mean, the, I don't know about the Billy Myers case, but I sure know that my worldview had no room for UFOs that showed up like right in your face like that. I mean, okay, UFOs off there in those funny little photographs, you know, and you enhance them and you can barely see them, you know, all that. But right there, you know, no, I can't go there. So, hoax. <laughs> hoax. I believed all the hoax. Well, I don't know, but this was pretty powerful presentation we just heard. Um, the evidence is not sufficient. Well, I don't think that's the central problem. I, I think you've heard a huge amount of evidence. You know this field very well. The evidence is overwhelming. Even the physical evidence is overwhelming. Never mind the thousands of reports. 
But that again has to do with the worldview matter. I, I, yeah, we should get more evidence. We should keep getting evidence, of course, but that's not the main problem. People say, oh, there's no evidence. You know, you hear that? Oh, there's no evidence. How many times have people said that to you? There's no evidence. They haven't looked. Or if they look, they don't see it. <laughs> Mark Macy made the point. You remember, he said, when he was talking about this extraordinary matter of these communications coming from the uh, astral and ethereal dimensions, he said, for some people, it doesn't matter how good the evidence is, it won't make any difference. Now, this is a little different. Our knowledge is insufficient and the available methods of study are inadequate. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I, I know there is something to this in the sense that I don't think, and I'll talk about this more, I don't think we have yet developed a way of knowing that has to do with something like this. In other words, we are okay about physical evidence, if we, you know, we, we know a good deal about that, but when it comes to something that seems to cut across all our disciplinary boundaries, uh, particularly when we're dealing primarily with human experience, as well, of course, as the physical phenomena, but there's a tremendous amount of this that has to do with reports, human experiences. How we know, our ways of knowing, uh, need to be refined and, and developed further. Can we get the... Yeah, can we, yeah. Uh, maybe it's happening, but it's too frightening to think about. Um, now, I run into that all the time. Okay. You know, I can buy it, but I don't want to think of it. That, that's too upsetting. That could be happening, that's a sense of loss of control, the helplessness. Um, one of my colleagues was very open to this, a psychiatrist named Bill Waterman, invited me to a, a fancy dinner in which, uh, you know, gourmet cooking went on, a lot of Boston politicians there, and you know how they want to be friendly with everybody, and, you know, well, I guess every place, but particularly in Boston. And, uh, and uh, one of them, uh, you know, I got to talking with him, and, um, little bit, and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work with people who've uh, had uh, encounters with the uh, beings, the extraterrestrial beings. <laughs> the, there wasn't even a moment of politeness. He turned around, said, that's too far out, and walked away. He didn't want to hear anything about it. He didn't care about my vote or my constituency or anything uh, else. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, part of sanity, I guess, is knowing who to say what to at what time, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't care in this uh, situation. <laughs> if it's true, we humans are less in control of our destinies than we like to believe and are thereby demoted in the cosmic hierarchy. <laughs> I think my prejudice shows through on this one. I... I uh, yes, <laughs> I think this is a very big one. I, I think that this is a huge, to use, I don't like to use psychiatric terms, but I, I will in this context. It's a huge narcissistic injury to us uh, that, that we are maybe the smartest, the most powerful, whatever, that beings can come and go and take us, or that they can whiz in and out of our airspace, sometimes not even show up in the radar. I mean, it's just... Uh, insult to what we think we do best, which is technology, right? I mean, it gets us right where we live. <laughs> the phenomenon breaks the game. That is, it threatens virtually every human vested interest. Now, this is fundamentally important. We've heard about the shadow government in the Jonathan Reed case. If you don't believe the Jonathan Reed case, take the one you just heard about Virginia and Brazil and the U.S. government, Brazilian government's collaboration there uh, to intimidate, threaten, not let this information get out. And in the last talk you heard about, you've been hearing about the, the, the power greed that goes on and the threat that this is to the power structure as it is, to so the financial institutions, to practically every institution uh, loses its dominance. If, if, uh, this, it's as if the whole church of science, of government, of the economic system no longer is the dominant force uh, on the planet and the, 
the resistance to this, the, the violent resistance to this is, you, is, we have to really pay attention to it and not be afraid, but be uh, strategic. We lack a philosophical framework for thinking about something which manifests in our world, but seems not to be of it. Now, this is a subject that I'm very interested in, uh, and I think many people are. Um, we've, we're pretty good in understanding the physical world, and we're you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, have learned a lot about the psyche. We've, but the Western enterprise over the last several centuries ha has more or less successfully, not, not in reality, but as a disciplinary device, has separated the physical world, the material world, from the unseen world, the, the, the deeper world, the implicate order, to use David Bohm, physicist's term. And this phenomenon doesn't seem to respect that boundary. It seems to somehow cross over. Uh, it's some kind of third realm. It's not entirely in the physical world. It's not entirely in the non-physical world. It's in both at the same time. It's sort of paradoxical. We don't, we're not very sophisticated about thinking in, in those paradoxical terms. And I'll, I'll be coming back to that uh, uh, again. All right, what further do we need to know? Now here, um, I'm not, when I go through this, I'm not saying everyone has to know all of this. I mean, surely I don't know all the things that I'm going to lay out. I just think these, this is what's relevant to knowledge in this, in this field. How do we better investigate the physical reality of UFOs, abductions, and related phenomena? Well, you've seen, heard some really good work on this. Uh, there's a, a lot more that could be done. There's a need for people from dis different disciplines, physics, psychology, anthropology, history of science, getting together to see if they can understand this more comprehensively so it isn't seen as just operating in, in a single uh, discipline. Now, what do we consider to be physical evidence? And what are our standards of evidence? Now, I've been, I was, this is the one they really tried to, you know, really hit me on very hard at, at Harvard. And, uh, uh, I mean, there's a great deal of evidence around, say, physical cuts, marks. Uh, uh, Angela Thompson Smith talked about the uh, circle of, of little lesions that appear. But I can't, as a physician, present that uh, to a medical audience because if there's a dermatologist in the crowd, uh, they're going to, you can imagine the questions they're going to ask, the self-infliction and mosquito bites and whatever. It's not true. They're wrong. But it, it won't pass uh, as evidence. So a lot of what will pass for us won't there. And I don't know what to do about that except to be as scrupulous and overwhelming. And uh, what was the term that... Uh, uh, Michael Horn used, uh, it was uh, that we have to reach an almost higher level. It's a Caesar's wife kind of thing. It has to reach uh, a level where there's just no denying the, the power uh, of the evidence. We can't do controlled experiments. The whole phenomenon won't stay still for us to, you know, take an alien and sit down and five aliens in a row and see how they behave. And, you know, uh, we, we have to do a kind of naturalistic uh, scientific, uh, take the information as it comes. But there are traditions of, of that, and certainly um, uh, uh, astrophysicists know they, they can't set up experiments out there in the cosmos that are going to make the, you know, the comets go where they want them to go and see how they work. You know, they have to take, study it in its, in its natural forms. Another thing, uh, oh, and that last one, another thing that I've thought about a lot, and I, I don't know what this will mean to you all, but it, the, you're familiar with the concept of the trickster, the trickster archetype? Um, well, the trickster seems to be having a field day in, in, in this field. I mean, uh, 
Just when you have something that looks like really solid physical evidence, pretty soon there's a fight starting between them. You've got a whole one group saying it's a hoax, another group saying it's, uh, it's for sure, it's real. And, and it's as if there's somebody being amused at our you know, uh, hubris in trying to pin this down in physical terms. You know, it's, uh, yet I, it doesn't mean we shouldn't study it physically. I just noticed that it looks like the uh, trickster is at work often in undermining uh, our very best physical data. We have something good and then, you know, I, I'll see, this happens to me all the time. I see, oh, wow, this is a great case, you know, wonderful. And I study it and then some group comes along and says, oh, it's a big hoax. They faked it. You know, the Billy Myers is a good example. I mean, the trickster was having a field day with us there. And the tr what the trickster does, uh, fundamentally, there's a great book about the trickster by a guy named Lewis Hyde. And the trickster, basically what, what it does, it's a, a force, an archetype in nature that shakes up a culture when it gets too complacent, that's what it does. It breaks up the forms. You know, Hermes is the ultimate trickster in the Greek mythology. And if we've gotten too kind of restricted into our sort of physical hubris, you know, and we're sort of so focused on small physical proofs, it's going to shake us up and make us look at things differently. That's, uh, now, a trickster's not a person. A trickster is a kind of god force of a sort or devil force or whatever in nature. How do we evaluate UFO or encounter reports when direct physical observations are not available or possible? Now, for me, this is a, a very important subject. And I, I'll read, the next one is really the same, in the same area. And I'll take these together. What is the proper methodology or criteria for examining experiencers' accounts? What constitutes reliability of witnesses in this area? Now, for for someone who works primarily with human experiences, this is a huge subject. And the, it starts out clinically, okay, but that's not enough. Like clinically, is this person telling the truth? Are they mentally ill? Uh, is this, uh, are they talking about something that really happened to them? Uh, is it a dream? Uh, and I do a clinical evaluation uh, of people, and as you know, uh, I'm on record as many, many times saying uh, that, by and large, uh, experiencers are sound mentally. They've been troubled by what happened to them often, but there's nothing in their personality makeup uh, that a psychiatrist would discover that has anything whatsoever to do uh, with the experiences that they've had, and that's based on a clinical evaluation. But that's not enough. And because you can, I, I notice when I talk to people and I present this clinical reality, if people aren't ready to go there, they, they're still not going to believe, or not take it serious. It's not about believing anything, but it's, so I, I've gotten interested in this notion, and I, I actually learned this from the Catholic uh, prelate who's uh, been mentioned here a couple times, uh, Father Carrado Balducci, who was, uh, you know, they have this, they actually have this in the Vatican. He's a retired Vatican demonologist. That's an actual job description in the Vatican, you know, and you know how seriously they take that kind of thing, you know. And, uh, and uh, at a conference in, uh, three years ago in San Marino, he said why the church takes this uh, encounter phenomenon so seriously. He said because there seem to be so many reliable witnesses. And we, he went on to say, know a lot about how to evaluate witnesses because we have to decide what miracles we're always dealing with miracles. So when you're dealing with miracles, you're dealing with miracles reporters. So they know how. They even use psychologists to examine children who see some you know, apparitions of the Virgin Mary. But it, they, have, they have very strict criteria for, and a lot of that is intuitive. It's, it's, I asked uh, Rod Skenendor yesterday, well, what do you do in, in native cultures, to, or your culture, to decide whether somebody's telling you the truth? He said, well, you go by the reputation that person has, whether it fits into what the tribe already knows. And there, there's some other thing. It's a, there's a kind of sacred quality that a truth teller has that you, you just know that person's telling the truth. You can be wrong, but there's something that you sense that this is, not a, this is a person who's telling the truth. They're, they're expressing this with a, that they've been someplace, they've brought something back uh, that, that's, it's almost a, like a sacred kind of function. In fact, I often feel that when experiencers who have that sacred truth-telling 
reliable witness quality get challenged by you know, media or insulted or whatever. This is unethical to do that. that you, it's unethical to challenge us. It's not just a clinical matter of science. It's an unethical act to contradict someone who is uh, bringing some kind of uh, truth from a higher dimension. There's a lot more to be said uh, on that subject. Uh, what new discoveries or developments in physics do we need to learn more about? And uh, I certainly don't, I'm not up to date in all of these fields. I don't think any of us are. But these are some of the subjects that are relevant to this. And the physicists that I talk with in the last decade or so, more and more physics is catching up, at least in theory, uh, in its possibilities to explain something that until the last 10, 15 years would be totally uh, outlandish. Sometimes I think that the uh, miracles and the new paradigm and uh, of reality and all of that, uh, it's hard to tell where we just don't know enough, we're not sophisticated enough in terms of physics to, to, to know. Uh, one, one kind of miracle and, and uh, new paradigm uh, of reality becomes gets taken over by a new understanding in physics and technology at, at some point. That's supposed to be Schrodinger's cat, I think. That's, uh, again, Will Boucher's uh, imagination, which, again, involves the paradox and quantum mechanics of uh, sometimes the cat in the box. You all know about that. Sometimes it's how do you know whether it's dead or alive? It can be both dead and alive at the same time. And you know, um, I will mention uh, particularly the notion of non-locality as uh, an area that I think is immediately apparent as important, which has to do with the fact that people can be influenced or something can change. There can be a relationship between people who are, uh, or between people and an object where nothing passes in between. There's simply a linkage in some way. It started out with subatomic particles, but now it seems to uh, apply in the uh, macrocosm as well, that change can occur without there being anything passing in between. In other words, there's a linkage already present. It's related to the, also to the notion of the quantum hologram. That is, that, that everything is already there. So in a sense, it doesn't require energy to pass. That It's simply what connection shows up at any given time depends on the context and the circumstances. The notion of interdimensional travel, for example, Michio Kaku, if any of you have heard him lecture, he's an uh, outstanding, brilliant physicist in, in New York uh, University, I think he is at now, and he, he talks about how uh, you don't really have to think in terms of, well, I can't get here because there's billions and billions of miles and all that. He says it could be that these other dimensions are simply present and, and there can be direct passage from one dimension to another uh, and that these beings, whatever, may have mastered the way to cross dimensions so they aren't dependent on vehicular travel in the primitive forms that we uh, think about. And that way, uh, objects, people can travel or beings can travel infinitely faster than the speed of light. The zero point energy, again, this is the people discovering that there is a huge amount of energy in space that we didn't know about until recently and that people are working on ways of harnessing that energy. So again, the spaceships might travel by somehow taking advantage of the incredible energy that already is present uh, in what was thought to be, uh, until recent, fairly recent years, dead space. What kind of shifts in our philosophical framework or worldview do we need to make to grasp this phenomenon more fully? I've got to keep track of my time here. Uh, Okay, we have to, we have about another hour, right? Something like that. Okay. Um, I've touched upon this, and um, again, it's it's a large subject, but I think that 
at the heart of it is to develop some kind of framework that allows us to live in the paradox of traffic between the unseen world and the material world. In other words, that there can be something that is not of this world in the material sense can manifest in the material world or it can pass across dimensions and manifest, or it can be not entirely of this world or of the other world, but of both at the same time. And th that's not the way we're generally brought up to think. I mean, I, I constantly am getting, well, if it's, we, if it's not in the physical world, this I get this all the time, I'm sure you do too, if it's not in the physical material world, it must be in the imagination. It must be uh, psychological. That's all. You know, there's no other subtleties. There's no other distinctions that occur. What sort of multidisciplinary collaboration would advance our exploration? Now, again, I can't overstress the importance of multidisciplinary work in this field. No one field can possibly grasp this matter. After my Harvard uh, ordeal wound up in uh, the August of 1995, I went to the then chairman of our department, who's long since gone, but he was not friendly to all of this. But I went to him, and I, after one of the recommendations of the committee was I should involve more colleagues in this work. <laughs> well, I had tried. I swear, I had really tried. You know. Uh, um, <laughs> It wasn't easy, so I said, uh, you know, I said, Joe, I've tried this, but, you know, uh, what, what should I do? And uh, so he said, well, why don't you do, he wanted to get me out of his office. He said, why don't you form a multidisciplinary working group, which is what they do in other kind of subjects like this, like sleep or weight loss or memory, things that don't fit into one discipline, and, and form a, a group like that and um, take a look at it. So took us a while to put it together. We were doing other things. It wasn't entirely because it was so difficult. But we, in April of 1999, we uh, had a meeting at the Harvard Divinity School, appropriately located there, although not sponsored by the Harvard Divinity School. You know, sometimes your best allies are the buildings and grounds departments of the universities, you know. <laughs> Because they just want you to rent the space. They don't care whether you're talking about spaceships or whatever. You know, the academics can, can be really mad, but the buildings and grounds department, they will always allow you to use their turf. So pick your turf where you want to go, and then you can do anything you want. So the Divinity School was perfect for this. Um, now, what happened there was we had professors from inside and outside of Harvard in ten different, about, about 10 different fields, anthropology, history of science, uh, astrophysics, optical physics, psychology, psychiatry, theology, philosophy, you know, other fields. And we looked at this abduction phenomenon in relation to other anomalies. And it was quite an interesting conversation. They couldn't get, they couldn't handle it. You know, everybody saw their little piece of the elephant and they tried to get around. And finally, the historian of science, who was a very sharp woman, young professor, tenured professor, really uh, done great work, and, and uh, about the afternoon of the second day, she shook her head, having really wrestled with this for uh, a day and a half. She said, John, this is a wily reality. <laughs> it just wouldn't behave itself. It, it just <laughs> kept, kept getting away. You know, it could, she couldn't pin it down. She couldn't put it any place, you know? And uh, another thing that happened, uh, she was also the chairperson of a working subgroup. We had about 25 people in all, including six experiencers who were each represented in these subgroups. And um, she chaired the subgroup on light and energy, which is one of the major, we had four or five major divisions of the field, and that was one of them. And she said, you know, at the reporting to the whole group at the end of this, she said, you know, it's a funny thing. She said, We'd start out, you know, we'd talk about light and energy, and we'd end up talking about God. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Um, so, uh, 
you know, interesting things happened when we brought people from all these different disciplines uh, together. So one of the things that emerged from this two days, which is uh, uh, something that I'm very interested in working on myself now, is that we really don't have what might be called a science of human experience. This relates to what we were talking about earlier about the clinical assessment of a witness or the, the witnessing phenomenon or how do we, how do we, uh, how do we look at, what are our criteria of knowing human experience when we can't prove it physically and where also it's, it's participatory. In other words, you won't learn anything about a human being's experience if you stand back and use the subject-object separation that characterizes much of, not the best science, but much science. Uh, because they won't tell you anything. You have to, uh, a clinician who any of you have worked with experiences, you know you have to really deeply enter that person's world. That doesn't mean you're leading them or it doesn't mean that you lose your uh, ability to, to be uh, analytic, but you, you have to enter that energy field in some way. You can't remain completely separate. Well, once you once you've, uh, are engaged in a kind of co-creative uh, participation with a person in bringing about or bringing into being their reality, then you know, that doesn't, that, that's a different kind of discipline. That's not science as the material science or physical science generally considers uh, science to be. So we, we, don't, we need to develop, I think, uh, a science, what I'm calling a science of human experience. So how can we be more effective in establishing the power of this phenomenon? positively or negatively, and knowledge about it to affect constructive change. Well, I've kind of hinted or indicated what I, what I think about this, and I'll just go through this uh, fairly quickly. It's a, I think that uh, one thing is to become more sophisticated in understanding physical evidence and physical laws. Again, the contemporary science uh, will enable us to communicate more effectively with, with scientists. Um, uh, even if it's just to learn the limits of physical laws as we now know them and be able to speak authoritatively about the limits of, of the, uh, what physical science knows. I mean, one of my favorite ones, and I'll share this, just say this here, is the, the so-called Big Bang theory, right? Well, a lot of people go by that in physics, but it's a very limited theory of the universe, I mean, how it came into being. I mean, if you ask a physicist, and I did ask one of my close colleague physicists, well, what, what about before the, the Big Bang? You know, how did, how did, you know, what was there, you know? He said, according to our mathematical measurements, that question is not relevant. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't get to, if, see, you can't be defensive when people do that. You have to realize that there was a mindset there, you know? So uh, the, a lot of the important questions don't yield their not, never mind answers, don't even yield deeper questions to the f frameworks of the of physics in, in the, not again the last, the most contemporary physics, but sort of traditional um, physics. Learn more about worldviews, scientific and political, and how these shape what we and others can take in. Well, I've, I've spent some time on that. I just, uh, one of my sons, who's very dear and, and very wonderful with me about all of this, and he, he's, I uh, can't say he's open about it, he just trusts me and we have a very loving relationship, but he said, uh, you know, he was starting out as a lawyer, he said, Dad, he says, I, I just hope that, uh, that I get my career established before they find out I'm your son. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I mean, I mean, he knew what the worldview out there was, you know. And, uh, um, one of my friends is a, a very well-known playwright uh, who writes about spiritual matters in his plays. Really, a, a, a very well known. He's written some Broadway uh, plays, and that are you know you you would know if I gave you the name of the plays. And um, and he was raised as a child as a, a pretty devout Roman Catholic. And he was educated in the extreme rationalism of the 20s and 30s and um, totally put his Catholicism behind and, uh, him and rejected it uh, by and large and became a, uh, well, he actually was a card-carrying 
person in several ways, but he, he was uh, certainly a, a card-carrying materialist in his thinking, not, not you know, in, ter in terms of scientific materialism. And, but he noticed in his 60s that he was beginning to drift back into the church, not, not becoming a member, but he'd kind of go to mass, you know, and he'd get in there and he I didn't ask him if he took communion, you know, but but I, but he he went into the into the church and he would feel something. He'd feel like he was in the presence of something that was much greater than the world that he had left outside. Some kind of it was an It wasn't so much the what the priests were saying, but just the it was a place to contemplate, a place to open his heart to the divine. And he would feel something that was way beyond what he knew outside. As soon as he walked outside, he, into the sunlight or uh, the, uh, this world, he, he would sort of put that aside. He'd say, well, that's what I did in there, but that's not what really counts. This is the real world. So I asked him, I said, uh, Bill, I said, why do you make that choice? Why, why do you determine that that world is, is not the one that is the true world and this is the, the real world? And he said, well, he said, this scientific worldview has had a lot more success in establishing itself in its version of reality than the one inside the church has had. Now think about that. That's uh, this a... Uh, you know, I don't even know what to say about that, but uh, it makes sense. I mean, it has in a way. It has dominated the, the. And if we're going to open to other worldviews, we have to become as rigorous and sophisticated and deep thinking about that that uh, as what has gone into creating this other uh, uh, materialist uh, religion. We need to develop an understanding of what gets called subtle energy phenomena. I, I don't think energy is the right word here, but because uh, it's borrowed in a sense, it's borrowed from physical uh, uh, language. But you know, it's like when people are in a room together and somebody says, "Oh, there's wonderful energy in the room here." You know, well, it feels like okay, energy, but it's not really energy. I mean, it's not like you could put a Geiger counter in the middle of the room and the you know the register would go up. It's it's something more subtle, more intangible, that you feel. It's not subtle in its impact, but it's subtle in terms of whatever it is. We don't know what it is. It's something unknown in a, in a way. Um, so I think maybe a better way of thinking about it would be think of a subtle realm, which would be, you know, like we're talking about the etheric realm or the astral world, that that's the subtle realm and that something that emerges from that realm and manifests in this realm is harder to is hard to study. It, it's not just physical. It's it's got some subtlety to it. We talk about body energy, uh, uh, the body energy field, and uh, but there's some qualities that the body energy field. Barbara Brennan has, uh, uh, who's uh, uh, worked with subtle energies, and has a school to study healing and and the use of subtle energies. And he says, she says that. Subtle energies are different from electromagnetic energy because electromagnetic energy tends to be finite. You can use it up in any given situation. But the more you enter the field of subtle energy, the more you employ it, the richer it gets. It grows. It's different than physical energy as, as we know it. Um, paranormal phenomena, parapsychology. People have talked, uh, Angela worked in the Princeton lab where they do, uh, they get, they have random number generation, and they show that the that people's uh, emotional states or what's going on uh, if, if they're all excited about a, uh, a football game that the the group energy quote unquote uh, will affect how the numbers are generated. Nobody knows how that works. It's not like something's passing into the computer the random number jet. Something subtle is occurring there, and and I, that kind of connection I think we need to understand more about. The, the power of thought, for example, or prayer to, to uh, bring healing, that's very well established now by all kinds of controlled studies, but we don't know how it works. It's not as if you know, you're praying for somebody on the other side of the country and, and uh, they get, it affects them and they get better, but it's not as if 
something that was me measurable that could be like you put a block between you and that person, it wouldn't work. It, it's not like that. So uh, that, that's what I mean by the subtle domain. I uh, expand our epistemology, placing more emphasis on, upon intuitive, holistic, and traditional ways uh, of knowing. Um, I, I don't like to defend myself um, because I think sometimes you lend energy to a, a criticism or an attack if, it, if you don't feel it's uh, truthful. But I, I have been um, uh, criticized a lot or attacked. It, it's been in the, on the internet that I somehow am opposed to Western science or I reject Western science. And this is absolutely not true. I mean, I, I think Western science has accomplished a great deal in, in knowing about the physical world and healthcare and uh, weapons development and all kinds of things. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's limited. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, when he was coming back from space and he had this spiritual epiphany as he saw the magnificence of the universe around him and he said, our our science, as he had learned, is limited. It's incomplete. There's much more to, to what exists, to what we are, that, uh, that we need to, to know about. And he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences in California to uh, explore and, and uh, enable that uh, increased richness of our ways of knowing to, to occur. Um, there are a number of writers now who are uh, working um, uh, or being very critical of these limitations of Western science. And um, it, it, a lot of it has to do with its environmental uh, consequences. In other words, if the, if, if the, uh, the universe, the world as we know it, is limited to the physical world, then that gives permission in a sense to rape the earth or do the things that uh, uh, we have been doing over the last uh, several decades through applying, misapplying the technologies of, of science. So um, that expanded knowledge that we need is something that does involve uh, a use uh, knowledge through the heart, the use of intuition, the opening up to the holistic knowing that traditional peoples uh, have have understood from thousands of years, which we need to return to, not rejecting Western science, but deepening our, our understanding of uh, reality and, and the ways of knowing. Uh, the person that I think is the most uh, uh, brilliant and powerful uh, writer on this subject is a professor of philosophy and religion at George Washington University by the name of uh, Sayed Hossein Nasser, N-A-S-R. And I, I think it's kind of ironic that he's a, a Muslim and he's a tremendously uh, knowledgeable, a great, great scholar. And uh, just read you a couple of things that he wrote along these lines because he can say it uh, better than I know how to say it. Uh, he says, for instance, not only is the invisible, the invisible, an infinite ocean compared to which the visible is like a speck of dust but it permeates the visible itself. In other words, often the argument is that there is a, that the, this reality, the physical reality, is, a, is contained within this large reality, is a subcase, but that the larger realms of existence are vastly greater and that uh, we focused on, on simply this one domain. It is this purely earthly science, whose earthly man defined by rationalism and humanism, who developed 17th century science based on the domination and conquest of nature, who sees nature as his enemy, and who continues to rape and destroy the natural environment, always in the name of the rights of man, which are seen by him to be absolute. Just one or two more. The total mode of that total, he refers to that total mode of knowing which illuminates and transforms the being of the knower 
and which already belongs to the eternal now, where the duality of knower and known is transcended. So you get the idea. Again, I've already spoken about the uh, participatory nature of knowing when it comes to human experience. I don't want to spend more time on that. Uh, I guess I don't have to tell this group but uh, that about the great threat to the techno-scientific hubris and the institution that s institutions which sustain it that this phenomenon uh, represents. Again, this is, it gets into the multidisciplinary uh, area. Uh, come to see the UFO and alien counter phenomena in relation to other physical and experiential anomalies. In other words, there are other, but again, we tend to be, the near-death people, they have their group, and the uh, dowsers, they have their group. Uh, and uh, the people that study the psi phenomena, uh, paranormal uh, mind-matter connections, they, they have their group. Uh, the people who study reincarnation, they, they have their group. And, but each kind of holds its territory rather sacred, and there's a great need to look at what do all these anomalies have in common. For one thing, they all operate in some way outside the ordinary space-time continuum. But there are many other matters that need to be looked at that I think would, if all these groups could get together and didn't hold on, well, I, I can go here but not there, that kind of thing, it, it, it would be uh, uh, very effective. Appreciate more the esoteric and sacred nature uh, of these phenomena. Now, uh, I'm trying to explain what I mean by that. I began to get the idea um, a year or two ago, that going in front of groups of people who really weren't able to hear this, uh, these experiences, was not the right thing to do. That there was something, that there's something about this that, that didn't fit. And I, that, when I asked Native people about, who came forward to say, oh, we know about this, I got a lot of support uh, uh, starting in the mid-1990s from uh, Native medicine men who came forward to support me said, we know about this. This is, uh, I said, well, why, why haven't you come forward to let, you know, before this? Well, they said, well, they said a lot of reasons for that. One is the anthropologists didn't know enough to ask the right questions. But, the, uh, <laughs> but, but more fundamentally, the matter is sacred. We're talking about divine matters here. We're not talking about something that can be reduced to, let's study it only scientifically. Again, it's not against Western science, but there, there is a different way of respecting this phenomenon, these phenomena that uh, has made me feel that it has a kind of special sort of, it's touched by, by higher, higher forces and that to, to not recognize that and to just present it, let's get it across to people because it's real, you know, is, is a violation in some way uh, of, of what we're uh, dealing with. Again, I've already referred to this, develop better collaboration among ourselves and more effective means of public education, especially the use of the media and public relations. Again, to resist this tendency we have to call each other names, to be divided uh, among ourselves, to any time we can't go there, it somehow becomes a hoax. I'm not saying there are no hoaxes, but have you noticed the tendency that or something, you, you know, you've gotten, you've just gotten to see something as really powerful and effective and it, you, you know, it strikes you as important and meaningful and you're there and then you read someplace in some UFO journal, it's really a hoax. And, you know, how can we possibly evaluate every time somebody says a hoax? I have a suspicion that a lot of things that get called hoaxes is just that it's too good to be true, that people can't go there yet, which isn't to say that there are no hoaxes. I just think we need to be more sensitive to the way we get divided uh, among ourselves and, and argue uh, among ourselves. All right. <laughs> <laughs>